As Benjamin Franklin said, after three days, fish and visitors start to stink. And uh, by the end of the war, the, the place was picked clean and, and businesses shut down and, you know, who are you going to sell to and you didn't, there was no money. We cannot imagine, based just on how we live today, what they were going through. Resilient people, uh, that's all I can say, is uh, they have to be to sort of suffer what everybody went through in this area and still keep going. The people just had to get on with their lives and they were still inside uh, resentful of the fact that this had been forced upon them and they did make the best they could of it but they were not very forthright in talking about what they had been through. Uh, they did not always tell their children and their grandchildren the situations they had been in. The history here is just beneath the surface, but almost completely obliterated. But it's like a kaleidoscope. All you do is one little click, and it all comes back into focus. Knoxville in the 1860s was very much a city divided. For the first half of the Civil War, Knoxville, like her sister cities across the state, was more attuned to the ideas of the Confederacy. Of course, 1863 was a year of huge transition. The year started very positively for the Confederates, and there's a great story uh, about Belle Boyd coming to town. She was a famous, notorious spy. Uh, she pulled uh, off some great exploits by running through the lines, bringing information from the Yankee side to the Confederate side. Uh, actually got the notice of, of uh, Stonewall Jackson, and he, um, he became kind of her mentor. And she uh, stays at Blunt Mansion downtown. She is a cousin of the Boyd family who is living in the mansion at the time. And this was the social center of town, so um, they had musical evenings, they had Confederate officers to visit, and they went on riding excursions. Belle talks about the wonderful gay parties that they go to, and she has a great time in Knoxville, and she writes about it in her autobiography. However, the cities were just small outposts in the great rural landscape of East Tennessee. These people were very independent. Some of them had settled in Tennessee after their ancestors had fought to make this country uh, a country in the revolution and they were very independent, very sure of where they were and, and what they expected from life, which was hard work, you know, their religion and the union. Ideas didn't always stay in the city or country. Sometimes those lines were blurred. In 1863, the Confederates left Knoxville to assist General Braxton Bragg in his fight at Chickamauga and Union General Ambrose Burnside came down from Ohio and occupied the city. When Burnside and the federal troops showed up it, and, and all of the people from the countryside came in, it seemed to them that it was a completely Unionist town. That, of course, was never true. It was maybe half and half at best. And now, of course, the social situation is completely reversed. The civilians who had the uh, superiority in terms of control and power and favor and all of that, those had been the Confederates. Well, with the Union occupation, all of a sudden those Unionists who had been very much uh, the underdogs socially and however else the town worked, uh, it, uh, they are now, they are the ones in command. After the victory at Chickamauga by the Confederates, they felt confident enough to send their troop, about 17,000, including cavalry, up here to retake the city. And as it turned out, it didn't work out that way. The race to Campbell Station is the key to Knoxville. And from where we're standing right now, about a quarter of a mile over there is uh, the Concord Baptist Church. And 
That's where a road that no longer exists intersected with Kingston Road. On the evening of the 15th of November, um, all the federal troops were stationed in Lenore City, which was Lenore Station at that time, and the Confederate forces of Longstreet had surrounded one side of it. Uh, so, early the morning of the 16th, Burnside realizes he has to s immediately get out. He cannot afford to be trapped. Burnside's the federal commander. So he goes along Lenore Road, headed this way. To make a very long story a little shorter, uh, they did get to the intersection first. They sent all their supply wagons ahead, and for a very short period of time, they held that junction so that everybody could get through and they could reassemble for what turned out to be the battle later on a little further down Kingston Road. The war was taking its toll on Knoxville and her citizenry. We don't really have a good grasp, I think, today on just all of the deprivations they did have. The army from the other side came in, the, the situation was reversed, and that left feelings that lasted for years and years. Even you know, socially, the, the ladies who care, the ladies who are stylish, the upper classes, you know, play, it's still a time where a look, an invitation or lack of an invitation, um, all of those things that are socially uh, advancing or socially off-putting, uh, imagine how that system tries to function in the middle of war. Uh, and, and the animosity that can mean, you know, on the larger scale of death, violence, disease, it means nothing, and yet to people who are still in, in enough a part of the culture to care, all those kinds of slights and redresses are gonna be content with. Back at headquarters, Burnside's men still had work to do on Knoxville's defenses. He asked one of his generals, William P. Sanders to hold off General James Longstreet's approaching Confederate troops, allowing Captain Orlando Poe's engineers to finish construction of Fort Loudoun. Burnside asked how long it would take him to finish the defenses because that's what all this delay was about. And Poe said they should be able to have them done by noon. Sanders said, I will stay until I feel myself totally pushed off the hill. I will not retreat at noon. I'll give you as much time as possible. Uh, the story goes that a sniper, a sharpshooter who was placed in our tower here at Bleak House, um, shot him off of his horse and he died uh, because of that wound. And so in his honor, the fort was renamed from Fort Loudon to Fort Sanders. Shortly thereafter, the uh, Union artillery uh, lined a shot up for the tower and uh, they, it came in through one of the windows, it ricocheted off the corner and embedded itself on the opposite wall um, and just the impact of that shot uh, killed the three sharpshooters. Sanders was shot on November 18, 1863. He died in the early morning hours of the 19th in the bridal suite of the Lamar House, now the Bijou Theater. All the while, Poe's engineers were working on the defenses around the newly renamed Fort Sanders. Every day that Poe has to increase the digging and the other amazingly innovative methods that he used to defend the line, every day made this place a fortress less and less capable of being taken, and in the end, they couldn't take it. Longstreet's men moved into position at Fort Sanders in the early morning of November 29, 1863. In the 11 days since the Battle of Campbell Station, Poe and his men had constructed a number of impediments around the fort. Fell trees and telegraph wires strung from stump to stump hindered the approaching forces, and then there was the ditch. The ditch in some places was actually 12 foot deep, and then of course there, were, there was the fortification itself above the level of the ditch. So it was in some places as much as 20 feet from the bottom of the ditch to the top of the fortification. The Confederates who had made their way to the ditch tried to climb up the outside, and a very few made it up. 
The men in the ditch were being bombarded. They saw no relief coming and they immediately realized that they had very little choices other than to surrender. So that is what they did. They surrendered. In a battle that lasted only 20 minutes, the Confederate Army lost 813 men while only five Union soldiers died. After um, Longstreet withdraws up into northeastern Tennessee, uh, Knoxville is uh, in pretty bad shape. Although they never were as starved as much as Longstreet had hoped, the, the community is really uh, torn up. There are people having to live in barns and this kind of thing. Houses have been destroyed. The civilian population now is totally polarized, is uh, without protection. So that outlaws, bushwhackers, uh, starving people, um, it's a horrible time for the civilian people. Of, of both sides. And so uh, the town of Knoxville is besieged. It's a refugee problem of, with huge, huge proportion of people who are starving and homeless. They have nothing and they need help. There were some people who came down who sort of began an economic recovery, but everyone here, I think from a civilian standpoint, were glad to see the war over and somewhat of a return to normalcy because uh, it just picked the area clean. I think that it's for that reason that 150 years later, Knoxville knows nothing about its own Civil War past. People had to leave it behind. You didn't want to drag it out every weekend and get dressed up and replay battles. This was real life stuff. This was death and uh, horrible deprivation in many cases. And yet, surprisingly, in some cases, people didn't, didn't seem to fare that badly. Um, but on the whole, the disruption of the whole social fabric was so stressful and so impossible to reconcile with getting on with life, they just left it there. And so you've got it in attics and archives and trunks and family stories. But in terms of the whole of Knoxville, acknowledging if you can't drive down Main Street and have any clue at all if Civil War ever happened here. <laughs>